Okay, good afternoon, all the Dhamma lovers from around the world. My name is Venerable Narong Shai. I will be your instructor for this Dhamma subject. So how can we study Dhamma? There's so many teaching. Have you ever thought of this? How many Dhamma have you learned so far in your life? How many teaching of the Buddha have you go through? How many sutra have you read in your life? It is said there are more than 21,000 21, teaching of the Buddha kept in the Sutta Pitaka. The teaching of the Buddha kept in the Pali Canon and is kept in the three basket is called Tipitaka. The mean three Pitaka mean basket. Okay, with the Vinaya Pitaka that kept all the rule and regulation for the monk and the nuns. The Sutta Pitaka, this is what we're talking about, is keep all the Dhamma where the Buddha and the great disciple teach back then. And the Abhidhamma Pitaka, there are three baskets. Okay, we will not go to this, but I will stop by here and there and you will learn something from the Vinaya Pitaka from another session. And okay, my job is to take you a tour to explore this basket in the next 15 weeks for the elementary level. All of those three baskets, it is said there are 84,000 teaching. A lot, right? How can we study all of this? To keep it short, okay, we can summarize everything in this text into three headings. The first one is called the Sila. Second one is called the mind, and the third one is called the Panya. The Sila, the mind, and the Panya, they are the short form of the, the Noble Eightfold Path. This is the path that leads to the Nibbana or the liberations. Whether you are monk, nun, novice, or you are a lay person, we follow the same structure of self-development, of intensive self-development. If you put the right Dhamma into practice, your life is happy at the moment. Okay? We don't have to wait until we get to Nibbana, a, a supreme happiness, but we can be happy here and now. You can be happy as a father, as a husband, as a boss, as a student, as an employee. Understand the Dhamma first. Okay, Look at the map. Get to know them first and then put them into practice. In this elementary level, we will be learning I would say a lot of the Dhamma from the Sutta Pitaka and make it easier for us to digest because it will be group, easy to learn, easy to memorize, the group of two, the group of three, the group of four, and so on. Okay, so these are the four subjects that I prepare. I don't know if we can finish all of this. We'll see. Okay. I can, like I said, it depends on the student and the teacher how deep we want to go. Because if you go through the books, like this book, or the books that you download it, it may take you one hour to go through everything in the books. I was sitting here, go to these few books in few days, so I have some idea what in there. But how much do we know? How much do we understand? If we go through that quickly and we take it very lightly, for example, for today, we are going through this. This may sound easy for many of us, especially if you are monks. You may feel like, oh, sati, oh, sampachanya, mindfulness and the comprehension. I know that. Oh, hiri, otapa, moral shame and moral fear. I also know that. What's special about them? What is khanti, patient? What is soracha? I think I know that too. What is Bupakari? What if Katanyu Kata Veti? I also know that too. Why so excited about this, you know, four uh, groups of Dhamma that we'll be, we'll, we are going to learn together today. So we can go deep, we can go superficial, we can go moderate. It depends on, like I said, the time that we have, the teacher and the student, how much they're willing to learn. Okay, my job is to let you know as much as Dhamma possible. That's one way of looking at. At the same time, I don't want to just go through it quickly, just give you the term and the definition. That's how you know, we do in the school, right? For, for the kids, but we adult, we should, we should think deep. We should reflect more. We should get a lot out of this Dhamma that you may feel 
simple that you may feel simple, but to me, I don't feel simple at all. Even though it's fall into the category of the elementary level, but as you study, uh, as if you consider yourself uh, a serious Buddhist, a serious students, you may see that this. Teaching like sati, the mindfulness, the comprehension, iri otapa is appear everywhere throughout the text, throughout the text, and how how can we put them into practice? How is our sati from the day the day one that we heard about it up to today, as we become a monk, as we become a lay Buddhist? How is your sati? How is your mindfulness? How is your Hiri, how is your otapa? That's that's something you should you know think deeper when it's come to the dhamma. And the Buddha always said, don't take the dhamma lightly. Whenever someone give the dhamma talk, he may be younger than you, you may have more education than whoever give that dhamma. The Buddha said, please do not take it lightly. Put your life into it, your ear, your eye, your heart, your your intention to listen. To listen. This is how you learn. You can always learn something from a person, even though. It's the same dhamma subject that you learn before, that you think you understand before. Okay, so in my life, I have been teaching this over fifteen years, the same subject. But you know what? I don't learn the same thing every time I teach. That's amazing of the dhamma. I teach the Four Noble Truths. I teach the Sutta, but I don't understand the same as I learned from last time before I teach. That's how deep of the dhamma, especially when you. Study and you meditate. This is the technique. The Buddhist text is not designed as the academic, just like other academic texts, to memorize and go take exam. No, you come back, you you read, you study, you go back and meditate, and you come back and learn it. You understand more. The Buddha always there to teach you something. When your mind is refined, you will pick up something that you never understand before. That's the beauty of the teaching of the Buddha. Start from the first group, the virtue of great assistance. Or pahukara kadamma, the virtue of great assistance. In this first group, there are two items on the list, which is sati and sampat chanya. Okay, don't worry if you are new to the Pali terms. I don't think there will be the Pali's in the exam. Okay, don't worry about it. Just want you to know what it is and how to put them into practice. Why they consider the virtue of great assistance? There must be a reason, right? There must be a reason. You may. Learn sati, you may learn sampajanya, you may learn mindfulness and clear comprehension, and why the Buddha put them together, and why the Buddha said these two virtues are the great of assistance. Why is that the virtue of great assistance? Assistance mean what? That means these two things, sati and sampajanya. We we'll get to the definition in a moment. For now, sati is mindfulness, sampajanya is the clear comprehension. If you're not familiar with the Pali terms, why mindfulness and clear comprehension are considered great assistance? Assist what? Is there anything that you do in your life that you don't need to have sati? You don't need to have sampajanya in terms of dhamma practice. Okay, these two things super super crucial to master, to understand, and to master. Sati usually translate to the mindfulness. I will give you another meaning of sati in a moment, which maybe surprise you, if you think you already know. And the second one is the sampajanya. These are the four common terms used throughout texts from many scholar. The comprehension, full comprehension, the clear comprehension, the full awareness, or the clear awareness. I will give you some other English term as well. This is when it come to study the Buddhist text.、Um, One Pali terms it can translate into many many meanings. So one English vocabulary is not always enough to complete the whole sense of meaning of that particular Pali word. Let's say the word vipassana, vi and patsana. Vi means noble. Patsana means seeing. You see something special. You see something noble. You see something that you never saw before. It's like it depends on which vocabulary seen fit the most through the lens of those scholar who translate the Pali. So when you go through the、uh, Buddhist text in English yourself, 
I suggest you to go through at least several translators. It gives you a better understanding of what it means uh, in that Pali terms. So here, sati is mindfulness for now. Okay, sampachanya are these four terms. There's another thing that about sati as well. It's about remembering yourself. I will explain a little bit uh, more in a moment. And sampachanya is the clear knowing. They are not the same. They are not the same. Uh, this is one of my favorite subjects. We can spend hours just go through these two things, sati and sampachanya. To me, it's super important if you ask me, among those 84,000 teachings of the Buddha, if I were allowed to select one thing for me to practice for my whole life that will take me to Nibbana, this is it. Sati and Sampachanya. Super important. Not the precept, not the dana, not the giving, not meditation, but start from here. How can you have concentration without being mindful? You cannot. Right? You just cannot. It's impossible. Let me show some of uh, this helpful information to see, to realize that sati and sampachanya is super important. When you go through the Satipatthana Sutra, which the Buddha talk about how to develop mindfulness, this is the teaching that he gives the full detailed explanation about how a man can develop mindfulness. And why should a man develop mindfulness? Why don't the Buddha just teach how to meditate? There is a reason for that, right? So if meditation is the goal, to have a concentrated mind, to have an undistracted mind, that's the goal. But how can we get there? And most people ask, oh, I have been meditating for many years. How come I don't make progress? How come I feel like I make a very slow progress in my meditation? Not many people talk about sati. Not many people talk about sampachanya. You're missing some important elements to help you to have a good meditation or good concentration or undistracted mind. To have an undistracted mind. And here there are three things involved for a man to have a good concentration. Number one, you must have sati or mindfulness. Number two, you must have sampachanya or the clear comprehension. And I, I like this translation. I call it integrating wisdom. Sampachanya or sampachanya is the wisdom element. The element that allow you to understand what's going on and how to deal with that situation. And is that all? No, there's another one here. It's called perseverance. The Pali term called atapi. Atapi is this one. Satima is this one. Satima. And sampachano is sampachanya. Perseverance is an effort, is the energy. This, this element is like an, a diligent element. It's just keep you going nonstop. It's keep you going. But if without, without the sampachanya, you will get stressed. You just get going. You don't stop, right? Sometimes you have to stop. If you try to visualize the object, if you try to uh, focus your attention to your breath, try to stop the mind from thinking. It may work in the first five minutes, but after 10 minutes, the mind gets tired and just want to quit. You need to balance all of this. You need to be mindful of what you do. You need to know how to do it properly, and you need to keep on going. Then concentration will come. It's a piece of cake, theoretical riddle. But in the practical way, you need to work on it. Okay, this is how important of sati and sapachanya. That's why it's considered the great assistance for you to be success in your meditation journey, in your dhamma practice. You need to have sati. And here, as you can see, that you may not realize all the major dhamma that the Buddha taught, they always have sati there. The five faculty and the five powers, the noble eight four path also have the right mindfulness. The seven awakening factors start from mindfulness. So how can you neglect sati? It's impossible for you to be success in your dhamma practice, in your meditation practice. Sati is super important. Somehow, it's the first thing that you learn in this elementary level. That's why I said, please don't take it lightly. Oh, I already know sati. I already know what it means. But there's something that you can, can get out of this subject if you really open up your heart, your mind, and, and try to understand what the Buddha means. And, and most importantly, try to connect the dot. All of this that we'll be learning, they are related. They are related. But for now, at the new student, you may not see how they related. How Sati Sampachanya support Hidi Otapa, and how Sorajja and support Khanti, 
and how can we go back and support sati and sapachanya? You may not see that at the moment, but they are related. That's the beauty of the teaching that you need to look for it. Sometimes you may not realize that they are they connected to each other. So the problem of the world, the world mean one human, us. In Buddhism, the world can be uh, this physical world and us as the five aggregate. You are one world. Lung Pina Lung Shai is one world. Okay, Haiko is one world. Jordan is one world. So what's the problem with the world today? The problem with us today is we are not able to keep the mind in the body. Human mind is everywhere. And we don't get used to that. And the reason we don't get used to that because we never realize that the mind should be trained to be back into the body, to keep the mind to the body. And that is why the Buddha teaches the four satipatthana where you should keep your mind all day long. Not to the world, but here. To the body, when you walk, when you talk, when you eat, when you do things, the mind should be with you. How you feel, you know how you feel. That means the mind is with you. All day long, the moment that you wake up until the time that you go back to bed, your mind is bombarding with all kinds of stimuli and it stays outside all day long without you realizing it. And when you come home, you want to meditate 30 minutes, you feel you're very tired. How come it took you a long time to calm the mind down and bring the mind back? Because you let the mind wander all day long. That's the problem. And how can we deal with this? Again, it's coming back to the principle of sati. All emotion that we go through in the morning, smiling, afternoon, sad, in the evening, cry. This is life. This is life. And that is why the number one global disability, according to the World Health Organization, is depression. Who doesn't have depression? Who doesn't have stress? The Buddha said a long time ago, unbelievable. He said, it is possible to find a man who proclaimed that, hey, I have been living for 100 years. I never have sickness, physical illness. Possible. Because there are people who live more than 120. Japanese people live really long. Some people live really long. But he said, it's almost impossible to find a man who can you know, confidently proclaim that I have no mental illness even for one second what it means by that is there's no moment that your mind in the perfect peace and calm stage the mind go after something all the time the food of the mind is feeling feel something all the time so that's why this day people have depressed people kill people people kill themselves it's kind of sad this is what's wrong with the world today and that's why sati is important whatever stream in this world stream in the defilements, the sati is their prevention. And that is the restraint of for the stream by wisdom they are shut off. You see how important of sati and sampachanya? That means if you put all the defilement in the world in front of you, if you only have sati, you can be safe. Short teaching, extremely powerful and get to the point. That's why I said if I were to shoot one thing, I would choose sati. If I don't know a lot of things in the Buddhist text, if I know what sati means, if I know how to practice it, I will be safe from all the bad things. Being mindful, that means you have sati. One, you cross the attachment to this world. Well, if you cross the attachment or the tanha, where do you go? Where the mind goes? It's liberated. You may not be able to completely get rid of them, but they may not harm you that much because you are mindful, you have sati. You see? That's just the beginning of sati. So what is state then? This is the definition I found in the Abhidhamma. All of this term, there is no one word that can explain the meaning of the word sati. Which is mindfulness, the constant mindfulness, the recollection, the act of remembering. Okay, this is interesting. The bearing in mind, the non-forgetfulness. So sati is opposite to forgetfulness. If you have sati, you will not forget. So the text said the right mindfulness. So, but it doesn't tell us what it means by right mindfulness. The the noble eightfold path, the factor number seven is called right mindfulness, and the factor number eight is called right concentration. So, right mindfulness is important. You need to have the right mindfulness. That means maybe the Buddha implied that there is something called the wrong mindfulness. 
okay we, sh- we will not discuss for the moment but just a food for thought for you to look for it this information and here we see the word mindfulness that certainly translate to mindfulness this is we we, we we running out of the vocabulary the good vocabulary what it means by mindfulness how do you translate mindfulness into simple English but people said oh you are at the present moment that means you are mindful is that correct interesting right I don't see this in the text what the Buddha mean by mindfulness what the Buddha mean by sati so you have to think uh, sati or mindfulness mean you know when your mind attention move to something else that's the practical meanings at the moment you meditate you breathe in and out you keep your mind with your breath and all of a sudden the thought come and the mind go after that thought in that moment if you can catch that that the mind supposed to be with the breath not the thought if you can catch that that means you are mindful otherwise you will get lost in thought and you cannot come back to the object of meditation in other words you remember of what you do you remember that hey I'm meditating I'm using anapanasati you see that is the, the word of sati I'm using the breathing meditation technique not the visualization not the mantra I remember this clearly and I'm doing it and at the moment that your mind attention chip or move to something else you catch it this is mindfulness okay so just for now it's a lot of thing to cover how you practice mindfulness this is again this is from the Satipatthana the Buddha suggests you to be mindful keep your mind in this four area all day long okay ask yourself where is the mind when you ask yourself where is your mind then you know where the mind is that means you are mindful then you bring it back you're supposed to keep on bringing it back habituate it keep bringing the mind back to the body more often to okay? get through the body mindful of you feel how you feel mindful of the mind that means if you get angry you know that you get angry if you might have lust you know that you have lust you just know that means you are mindful that hey now the condition of my mind is not the same it's not clear as I want it to be okay and the my object this is something a little bit deeper okay what caused that angriness what are the five hindrances what are the five aggregates okay which uh, again this is the advanced level but uh, just to keep it simple be mindful of your body when you walk you talk you eat okay? be mindful of how you feel be mindful of what you think okay and make sure you bring the mind back to be at the calm and clear state of mind to keep the mind joyful that's the idea of practice you know sati and what is sampachanya sampachanya this is the definition that i found in the uh, abhidhamma which is cover pretty much the whole aspect of sampachanya sampachanya translate to wisdom sampachanya translate to the clear comprehension which we found them here its wisdom elements is understanding its investigation its research that means it's it's it think of something its discernment its differentiation its erudition proficiency subtly analysis consideration guidance there may be some of this that makes sense to you take it insight awareness controlling faculty of wisdom the absence of dullness the truth investigation and the right view you see if you are asked where is sampachanya fit into the the noble eight four path sampachanya is fall into the first item on the list of the noble eight four path which is the right view this is advanced this should be in the exam of the advanced level but for now just hear me out don't worry about it so sampachanya is is wisdom is the wisdom element it help us to understand it help us what to do okay when we face a certain situation and this is how you practice uh, sampachanya the buddha teach very simple when he teach the monk how to develop sampachanya the moment that the monk wake up okay when when you get dressed when you put the arms uh, when you put the robes on when you when you walk arms round when you come back Okay, when you eat when you go toilet when you go to bed you must be mindful and you must be fully understand of each moment of what you do so here the text is going 
uh, forward and backward, looking toward and looking away, bending and extending limb. It's just it's just the idea of the body, right? The body, you know, do something. You know, the body walk, the the body sit, the body stand, the the body look back and look forward. Okay, just bending and sitting, standing, this and that. This is just the body part, but uh, the idea is everything that you do, you must fully understand. Not only you mindful, you should know fully of what you do. Okay, my quick question for you here is how and when Sampachanya or the clear comprehension be arisen? How? We learn sati. We know sati means what? Sati means you know when your mind attention move to something, then you catch it. Right? And how, when can Sampachanya happen? Sampachanya cannot happen by itself. How can you comprehend something without being mindful? That thing must be in front of you. So another meaning of sati is you, you be with something in front of you fully. When you be with that thing fully, then you look into it, then you study it, then you understand what it is, and then you understand how to deal with it. So sampachanya can happening after you are mindful. It cannot happen alone. Okay, look at this. This is the summary. The mind is like the horse. The horse, the wild horse, will be running away if you don't tie them up to the pole, right? You cannot just get on the horse and riding the horse right away. It will not allow you to do that. So to train the horse, you need to tie the horse to the poles, and this is the mindfulness. And the poles is like the concentration or your meditation object. And why is the sampachanya? Why is the clear comprehension? Okay, you back to the same example. You sit and you observe your breath. You breathe in, you know that you breathe in. You breathe out, you know that you breathe out. You breathe in short, you know you breathe in short. You breathe out short, you know that you breathe out short. Long and short, in and out. You know. That means you are mindful, right? You tie your mind with the breath. But there may be the moment that the mind following some thought, the mind falling asleep. At that moment, you can catch that. And when you catch that, you are mindful of what is happening, that, hey, I'm falling asleep. Hey, the mind is not with the breath. So in this moment, the, the Sampachanya will take action. Said, you know what? Let's wash your face. You know what? Let's have a cup of hot tea first and then come back and sit. Don't just sit there. You know what? You, you focus too much on your breath or, your, or the object. That's why you have stress here and there. You're not relaxed. Stop doing what doesn't work for you. This is the Sampachanya roles, very important roles. And then you adjust, then you find yourself more relaxed with your meditation object, and then you continue. And the next five minutes, it happens again. The mind go after the thought. Okay, the, you, if you can catch it, that you mean mind, that means you are mindful. And when you are mindful, the Sampachanya will help you to be able to do something about it. Maybe change the technique, maybe switch your leg, Maybe do whatever it is to come back to the same stage, which is the state of my being calm, being relaxed, and being happy. Then you can continue. This is how they support each other. Today, we will not talking about the samadhi yet, but I'll show you here so you can see the relationship among these terms, this dhamma that we are learning. Okay? All right. So this is how people live their life. When you eat, you listen to the music, you watch the movie, you read the news. You do all kind of thing at one time. This is bad. This consider bad through the of Buddhism. That means you habituate your mind to be busy, to be distracted. You don't even know what's in your mouth because your mind is not with the food. Mindfulness is not there. The mind change moment to moment. Oh, listen to the nail, make decision uh, of, uh, of what to do and, and, and put something in the mouth and chewing and write down, make a note. You busy your mind. Okay, you should stop, put everything down. When you eat, you eat. When you work, you work. When you cook, you cook. Don't, don't, don't do a lot of things at the same time. You may be harming yourself. And when you, this is how you develop mindfulness and uh, sati and sampachanya in your daily life. When you do things, you focus. You take your time, okay? How to clean the shell? What kind of clothes? What kind of color? What kind of material should I use? How much detergent should I need? How much water should I need? This is Sampachanya practice. Simple, seem to be mundane, but you, you practice Dhamma in your daily life if you really understand what it is. 
what is sampajanya, what is sati. How do you brush your teeth? How many times you brush your teeth? You brush the upper teeth first or the lower teeth? How many times for the upper teeth that you brush? How many times did you brush the lower teeth? When you gonna finish? Sometimes you don't even know that you are brushing your teeth because you listen to the music, you think of the meeting or of the homework, whatever it is. And before long, you finish. You you don't even realize that you know whether your your teeth is clean or not. You you live life like an autopilot, all the time. So summary is that the mindfulness is the sense of remembering. Okay, it's a, it's a reminding yourself before or while doing something. You know what you're doing, and you know when the mind is not there. And s a m p a c h a n y a is the fully understand, fully aware of you doing something. Okay. Okay. So I think I spend a lot of time on these first two dhamma, but the rest, you know, another three groups. Maybe we can go a little bit faster because I like you to see how important of the dhamma that you may feel like, oh, Long Pi, it's simple. It's not. It's not that simple. Okay. So we move on to the next one. The second group is called dhamma for protecting the world. A l o k a p a l a d a m m a which point to h i r i and o t a p p a in Pali. You get to know the meaning in the moment. Okay, when you hear this, you need to think. I like you to think that okay, why these two d a m m a the Buddha put them together, and why the Buddha mentioned that or the Buddha teach us that these two d a m m a consider the d a m m a that protecting the world. And I did mention already when you hear the world. The word "world," when you study Dhamma, you think of two things: the physical world, where we live, here, and the individual world. Okay, one life, one world. That means this Dhamma can protect the whole world, and can protect individual too, if you practice them correctly. All right. What is h i r i You may heard them for the first time, or you may come across them more often. What is h i r i h i r i the The vocabulary used often in the text is conscience, but I like this one: the moral shame or the sense of shame okay, of doing something bad. That's called h i r i Okay, it's um, the feeling shameful of wrongdoing, both when no one's around and when people see you in public and in private, you feel shameful, feel very shameful. It's The self-respect, the idea of you feeling shameful, it's come from yourself being shameful. I I can't steal someone money because I'm a monk. I feel shameful. I can't do that. I can't telling a lie because my father raised me very well. He's a teacher. He's a priest. I born with this family, the family of a good man. I can't do it. So it's a self-respect. It's the text says. You feel shameful. You cannot leave your house naked. Nobody can, right? You feel very shameful. So same thing. We feel shameful of doing something that we know it's bad. And this h e r i will help strengthen the sila or precept. You may not realize that. Oh, how come h e r i help fortify or strengthen the sila? If you think of the first five students, the panchawaki. When the Buddha gave the first teaching, the Dhamma c a k a p a v a t a n a Sutra, the Buddha did not mention anything about precept, about the Vinaya. There was no rule in the first 12 years of the teaching career of the Buddha. There was no one rule mentioned or laid down. So that means the monk from the first monk Anya k o n t a n y a to the monk in the first 12 y e a r s they don't learn about precept. They don't worry about precept. They live life based on this virtue, h i r i and otapa. I feel shameful. I'm a monk. I shouldn't telling a lie. I shouldn't have sexual misconduct. I'm a monk. It's by default. They are virtuous, so there's no rules. And later on, the people from different walks of life come and all then start doing something bad. Then the Buddha, when something happens, so he call for the meeting, and then he issue the rules. That's how the vinaya gets started. But before, there there was no rules. There's only h i r i and o t a p a Okay, and the second. Item is otapa. Otapa uh, usually uh, translate to English in this four vocabulary: the fear of wrongdoing, the moral, moral fear, moral dread, concern, or the scruple, whichever that makes sense to you. Okay, this four vocabulary try to explain the word otapa in Pali. 
is the fear of the consequence of the wrongdoing that a person about to do. That means this person know that doing this is bad, right? Uh, if someone steals something, you may have to go to jail, and you don't want to go to jail because there's a consequence of stealing someone's stuff. It's against the law. That's why I will not do it because I don't want to go to jail. This concern others. It doesn't concern yourself. It doesn't concern your integrity or your virtue. It concern because you feel like if I do this, I will look bad. I don't want to go to jail. I make my family look bad. I make myself look bad. Or someone may fear of if you if you the Dharma student, you understand the law of karma. You may have the concept of merit and demerit and heaven and hell. If you break the precept, you may go to hell. This and that. Killing someone is considered breaking the first precept. There's a consequence of doing that, right? You may have to go to jail while you're still alive, and you may have to go to hell after you die. And we study dharma, we know that. So we don't kill someone because we fear of the consequence. We don't want to go to jail. We don't want to go to hell after we die. And that's the reason why people fear because they understand the reason, the consequence of this bad thing that they're about to do. But here it is opposite, right? Here it is, you don't care about the consequence. You don't care whether go to jail or heaven or hell. I will not do it because I love myself. I respect myself. I don't need to worry about the consequence. They are not the same between Hiri and Otapa, but they support each other. Like, like this, Otapa I means if you know that there is the poison snake over there, you will not go there because you, you have fear of being bitten by the, the snake. You go other direction. And that's the reason why we don't go there. We fear of snake. And there is no snake, we may go, right? If there's no law said, if you steal someone's stuff, you go to jail. So you may steal it because no such law mentioned. This is a big difference. So here, uh, it's like, here it is like you, you see the, the stuff is dirty. You don't want to touch it because you don't want yourself to be dirty. But the otapa is like you see the hot burning stone. You don't want to touch. The reason you don't want to touch is because you don't want to get burned. You know the consequence. I don't want to get burned, so I don't touch it. I scare of touching that hot burning stone. This is, this is the difference. So my question to you is, which one is more important and why? Between number one, hiri, and number two, and otapa. So back to the definition, hiri means you respect yourself, right? Whether in public or in private, you will not do anything bad. But otapa means you either fear of the law, the consequence, when you break the, the state law or the uh, custom law, if you break that law, you may look bad, right? And if no law said, oh, you can steal someone's stuff, then you may be stealing some, someone's stuff. But with Hiri, you will not do it, whether someone see it or not. Doesn't matter what the law says, you will not break precept. You will not do something bad. So for me, I feel like Hiri is more important. But again, we need to understand both and practice both. And why Hiri Otapa are considered the Dhamma that protecting the world, this appear in the exam, in the Thai exam. Your job is to know why and be able to answer this question. Okay, so I will leave it for you to be a food for thought. All right, so we move on to the third one. The third group is called the Great Food Dhamma. Sopana, Sopana means beautiful. The Dhamma that make us as a human beautiful. In the worldly view, beautiful means your hair, your dress, right, your gesture, you dress nice, people say, oh, you look nice, you look beautiful. But in the eyes of the Dhamma, no, we don't look through these material things. We look to inside. And the Buddha picked up two things among all the Dhamma. He picked two things. If you have these two things, you are considered a beautiful person. The first one is called Khanti. Second one is called Soraja. Today, we, we come across several uh, Pali terms. Again, don't worry about this term. They will not be in the exam. Okay? No, you don't have to memorize it. But it's good to know. Okay? If you are, like I said, if you are serious Dhamma student, it's almost unavoidable to encounter the Pali terms. Okay? When we chant, we say, Alhang Samma Samputo Pakawa, we say, Namo Dasa. What does it mean? It's the Pali, right? We learn Atta Anatta, it's a Pali. We learn Paticca Samupabada, it's a Pali. All the Dhamma is kept in Pali, so that's something you need to keep in mind. But for in this class, 
just hear the term, know what it is and how it works. No need to worry about memorizing the the Pali. The Buddha once says, when a person is irritable, overcome and overwhelmed by anger, he does bad things, body, speech, and mind. And when his body breaks up, when he dies, after that, he reborn in a place of loss, a bad place, the underworld, the hell. You see how this translator tried to explain the word hell. He used three words, place of loss, bad place, the underworld, but it points to the same thing, which is the hell. So here the Buddha tried to teach us that if your mind is irritable, if you get angry, you can break precept. That means you don't have patience, you don't have khanti. When you don't have patience, you allow anger to overcome your mind. You can say something bad, you can do something bad easily. And when you do that, you break precept. Where the man go? If he keep on breaking precept after he die, he go to hell, right? According to the teaching of the Buddha. So khanti, khanti usually translate to patience, to forbearance, endurance, and tolerance. You name it. Uh, this one of these may make sense to you. But let's see if you understand the real meaning or the character of khanti. It's not just patience. Khanti is opposite to khanti is opposite to the defilements called hatred or dosa. And that's why it's called a dosa or non-anger. So when you have khanti, you stand opposite to anger. Okay, is the absence of rudeness. It doesn't mean that you suppress the anger too. People think, oh, khanti means I suppress the anger. At the beginning of your practice, this dharma, that's how we feel, right? We have to suppress. When someone says something bad, I don't like it. So, but I suppress it so I don't say something bad to him. Initially, that's how it works. But eventually, that's not. Your mind will become neutral. That's khanti. The ability to remain neutral. With the good situation, bad situation, you understand what's going on. And the reason you understand what's going on because you are mindful. You have sati. See, sati support khanti. And when you have sati, you have sampachanya, or the wisdom elements start function. When the guy says something bad to me, what should I do? Should I say something bad to him? Should I direct my mind towards something else? You see how dhamma are related. So when you learn, I like you to do your homework to connect the dot okay, of the thing that we learn. And how you practice khanti, you need to develop metta or the living kindness. Otherwise, it's going dip- to be difficult for us to not to get angry. But when we have metta, the mind is always soft, calm, and relaxed. And that supports khanti very well. In Thai, we call otthon, which I really, I, I really like this. I don't know who come up with this term. In Pali, we call khanti, right? And we try to understand the character of khanti. But in Thai word, there is a word called otthon, which gives us the complete dimension of the word khanti. Ot means you do not get what you want. Thon means you get what you don't want. I said, wow, this is very clever. Whoever come up with this term in Thai, Othon, Oth means Othklan. You don't get what you want. In life, we not always get what we want. And what can we do? You have to patient, right? We have to have Khanti. Oftentimes, we don't always get what we want, and sometimes we get what we don't want. You may not expect the rain, but it's raining, right? And you don't like it. You go to work, you hit the traffic. You get something that you don't like all the time and you might get agitated and then you get angry and then people kill people. Come from this because they don't have patience. They lack of patience. They lack of mindfulness. As a monk, we always say, if you expect some hot food, you get cold food. You expect cold food, you get hot food. You go arms around today in the village. You don't know what to expect. Whatever put into your bowl, you eat that food. Maybe the food that you don't like. You expect rice, you get noodle. You expect pizza, you get eggs. You want KFC, there may be no KFC in the village for you. You know what I mean. And what can you do? 
you need to atone, you need to be patient, then you'll be okay, right? And this is more difficult. The more difficult ones in, when it's come to patient, you may think of, okay, when someone says something bad, I can remain calm. That means you have patience, you have kanti, which is correct, which is good. If you can take this to the next level and ask yourself honestly, you may feel like I am a patient person. When someone says something bad, I'm okay. When someone cut off my lens, I can remain calm. This is good. That means you have, you have developed kanti in you. What about if someone press you? Can you stop smiling? Can you stop yourself from smiling? This is more difficult, right? People like to hear good things. People like to be pressed. If someone press you, you know, your mind is like, wow, you know, joy and super happy. And one more of that. This is the defilement. Imagine yourself, if you press the Buddha, how does he feel? Would he be smiling a lot? Or he just remain calm? Think about it. This is, this is patient. Okay? This is more difficult. If you already practice the first step, why don't you go up and practice to the second step? When someone press you next time, can you remain calm? I understand. Okay. I know how good I am. People say, oh, you speak English very well. And then you smile. And then another listener say, oh, you speak English very bad. And then you sad again. The mind is like up and down. So the type of patience, the patience to nature, okay, it's too hot, too cold, hungry, thirsty, I don't want to go to work, I don't want to meditate, today is too cold. This, you don't have patience. Patience to illness. When you are sick, you are sick. You need to you know, heal yourself. You need to be patient of that sickness. Okay? The right treatment, take medicine, take a rest. Nothing much you can do, you have to take a rest. You may want to work, but you cannot, right? The body not allow you to do that. So patience to live with others, this is a more difficult. Wherever we go, wherever human exists, there's always a problem. There are always a conflict. The reason is very simple. Because we are ignorant beings. We make mistakes all the time. People always give us a hard time, right? So we need to be patient. We not always get what we want. And we not always get okay, what we don't want. That's how life works. So patient to the defilement, this is more difficult. Okay, the defilement. For example, if you plan to sit and meditate for one hour, your intention initially was very good. So you sit after 30 minutes, and then all of a sudden, there may be the inner voice telling you that, you know what, let's meditate tomorrow. Tonight there's the, the movies or it's the show. Let's go watch movie first and meditate tomorrow. So you fight with the defilement in your mind. Should you continue to sit? Should you quit sitting and go and watch movie or the show that you want to see? This is patient to the defilements. So the Buddha compare patient to the earth. This is the earth. The earth doesn't care whatever people throw into it. Hot or cold, you know, garbage or flowers, something smell good, something smell bad. The earth doesn't care. The earth remains calm. This is how we should develop our mind to be like the earth, to be stable, to be strong. Okay, and this is, if you like, check out the simile of the soul. The Buddha talk about the patience and Buddhism reject all form of violence, body, speech, and mind. You may not say something bad, do something bad, but you may be thinking bad towards someone violently. That's not the teaching of the Buddha. All right, so check it out when you have time. And soraja is gentleness, modesty, restraint. The first meaning of Suraja is restraint in the body and speech, which again is point to Sila. Suraja is you are able to keep your mind joyous and radiant in all situations. You will not break precept. Patient can be stressful, right? You, you may be patient, but your mind is not joyful. In meditation, you may be patient to sit for one hour. If you can make your mind joyful, that means you develop something called Suraja. But Suraja usually Easier to understand if you think of a person who are ill, if you think of a person who are ill like this. Okay, Kanti is ability to remain neutral when experiencing both pleasurable and unpleasurable situations. But Soraja is the joyous mind when facing the hardship. You think of this at work, right? People may say something bad or do something bad to you. With Kanti, with patience, you can remain calm. And when you remain calm, that means you have mindfulness, 
and when you have my four, you have sati, then you can develop some pachanya of what to do, right? You don't have to say something bad to them. This is you can put both khanti and soracha together. In my personal example, you know, I when I think of soracha and khanti, I think of my mom. She was six. She passed away three years ago, and she has the cancer, uh, liver cancer. Every time I pay visit to her, she never cry. She never complain about her life. She always remain calm. She never look for power from anybody. She just remain calm. She always smiling, even until her last breath. She was very strong. She was very patient. She was never show her weakness. She always smiling, and, and instead of me motivate her and encourage her, oppositely she motivate me and encourage me. To be strong, don't cry. I'm okay. Smiling. Have you ever visit someone at the hospital? By you look at them by seeing that person, it motivate you that wow, this person is somebody. How can he or she remain calm in that fatal disease, in that in that you know difficult situation in life? And this is called so raja. Don't complain. Don't cry. Don't say something bad to anybody. Train your mind to be in that stage, to be calm and to, okay, and do your best to keep your mind in a good stage, which is the state of mind that being clear. So, okay, benefit of patient. This one again is in the text here, easy to understand. Okay, you will be lovable, right? If you are patient, you have a little uh, enmity, you have a few faults because your mind is calm, and you won't feel lost when you're about to die, and when they die. You born in a good place. Okay, this is again is understandable because your mind is not overcome or overwhelmed with anger, which is clouded the mind. So you need to cultivate loving kindness. You need to develop hiri o t a p a You know, when you do something bad, if you're not patient, this is the consequence that you will receive. It's not worth it. Okay, and you need to be mindful. Mindfulness is everywhere. Okay, and perhaps you can habituate the, or direct the mind toward the wholesome thought. When you facing something that you don't like, and the reason you can do this, is start from you being mindful first, and when you mindful, it give rise to the s a m p a t a n j a or the wisdom elements to take place. Practice k a n t i to patient, be patient for all unwholesome stimuli that come to your life. Continue to do good thing, whatever people said. Maybe people may not agree with you at the beginning. If you believe this is good thing, continue doing it, and be patient, okay, to maintain calm and clear state of mind. At all time, all right. I like this picture a lot. Okay, as a peace study student, this is what we learn. How try to understand the meaning of peace. Okay, in the midst of life storms, we can be in a per perfect peace. And the reason we can do that because we have patience, right? We have khanti and we have soracha. We have mindfulness and we have the clear awareness or clear comprehension. See, sati s a m p a c h a n y a Khanti and soracha support each others, so you can remain calm in all kind of situation in your life. Okay, let's move on to the last one. The last uh, group of today is called the rare person. The Buddha said uh, these two kind of people are rare. The first is called b u p a k a r i Second is called katanyu katawethi. There are two things. The Buddha once said, "This is how you should train yourself." We will be grateful, which is k a t a n y u and show gratitude, which is kata w e t i We won't forget even a small thing done for us. If someone do something good for you, even a little thing, don't forget. Oppositely, if someone do something bad to you, little thing, forget it. Don't keep it. This is how you practice. People usually hold on the bad thing. <laughs> Not the good thing. So your job is try to let go, memorize the good thing, and find way to repay, to pay back those good things that you receive from others. What is bupakari? Bupakari. Bupa mean it's it's come before, first or before. Kari mean action. So bupakari mean a person. Bupakari person mean a person or a doer. Who give the service first? Who support first? Or the one who is first do a kindness to you, to us. That's called b u p a k a r i And the second dharma that m e n t i o n that group t o g e t h e r here in this group is called k a t a n y u and k a t a w e t i There are two vocabulary merged together here. k a t a n y u is 
you know you recognize that this person do something good for me and กระตะเวที again you feel grateful for that and you will find way to pay back to them to those good things that they have done for you so recognizing and repeatedly recollection the help given by anyone okay that you receive whether little or much or the one who is grateful grateful for a kindness done and feel obligated to repay it. this is the idea of k a t a n y u k a t a w e t i person and they must be practiced together the kindness and gratitude must be cultivated together the reason i see that because from my experience i have seen a lot of people we recognize that people do something good for us but we never pay attention of how can we pay back to them how can you pay back to your parents that they raise you they take care of you how can you pay back to the buddha that he teach us the dhamma how can you pay back to your teacher that teach you how to live good life how do you pay back to your parents your boss your employee whoever do something good for you this is something that missing as a dhamma student make sure that you practice both okay i believe we recognize the good thing that people done for us but how many time that you make an effort to do something back for them okay just keep that in mind don't take everything for granted this is the heartfelt consideration of the kandat katanyu kata v t you have actually benefit from them they do something good you benefit from that thing that they done for you second you trust the motive behind those action that they wish you the best that's why they do good thing for you they don't have any hidden agenda they do good from their heart to you they wish you the best and you can sense that the other person had to go out of his or her way to provide that benefit to me this is very touching you can think of your parents parent do something good for you is there any hidden agenda no right you can sense that they're sincere they have to make an effort they have to work hard to find us food clothes send us to good school that's the parents so they do something good for you i don't know how much as a son and daughter you realize how much our father and mother have to sacrifice themselves for us for the goodness of us for the wellness of our life there so there are four group of people that that mentioned in this uh, elementary level of the dhamma study of uh, the rare persons the first is parents right and students the relationship between parent and students the teacher and the students the kings and the citizens or the the presidents the prime minister the community leaders and its citizens and the buddha and the faithful followers you think of the buddha think of the the buddha that spent six year torture himself the more you study the buddha history i i hope that the more you appreciate and grateful what he had done what he discovered and he share with us with no condition with love and kindness purely he wish us the best to listen to this uh, dhamma or the truth of nature and we be put into practice you know our life will be happy the buddha did not get anything in return right it's considered the rare person what about our parents they, they take care of us do we plan to take care of them or we just abandon them okay this is what i see in the west people usually put their parents into the nursing home don't stay with me just stay there but in thailand we don't do that we stay together same house till the day we die or separate from each other okay, so we pay respect to them we respect parents just like the arahan in the house who give us life who take care of us give us food give us education whatever it is they sacrifice their life a lot sometimes many parents will go to hell to save the children they have to kill the fish kill the chicken to feed the children then they go to hell they willing to do that you see we should appreciate that so consider this these three factors someone do something good for you keep that in mind five way and go back and repay them your teacher as well they teach they have to do a lot of thing prepare the teaching teach you the best without getting anything in returns so then take everything lightly then take everything for granted okay appreciate it and if you can then five way to show your appreciation okay why bupakari and katan you kata v t person is rare this is again this question is in the exam so you need to think okay your job tonight is to think 
why these people are considered rare according to the teaching of the Buddha. All right, that's it. Perfect timing. I hope not overwhelm you too much of this information. If anything, just let me know. I'll adjust next time. So this is the first class. There may be some thing that not uh, go smoothly. Maybe a lot of things that you feel like it should be adjusted next time. Again, feel free to let me know. And I'll do my best to prepare the lecture and send you the file at least you know one day before the lectures, so you can go through it first and prepare yourself first. If you don't have time, it's okay. Like I said, uh, be happy. Come to the class with good mind and learn something that benefit you. May the Buddha bless you. Take care, everyone. See everyone again uh, next week.